Swinburne University of Technology. Welcome to our friends, our alumni, our staff and our students to our second Chancellor's Lecture for 2013. My name's Andrew Smith and I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land, the people of the Kulin Nation, and to pay my respects to their elders past and present. For tonight's function, I would ask that if you could uh, turn all mobile phones and electronic equipment to silent, that would be appreciated. And we will be recording this evening's lecture and that will be available as a podcast on the Swinburne University website. We'll have an opportunity for questions later in the evening and those questions will also be available as part of the podcast. And now it gives me great pleasure, and it is my privilege, to introduce you to, to you the Chancellor of Swinburne University of Technology, Mr Bill Scales, AO. Andrew, thank you very much for that, uh, for that introduction. And can I also join with Andrew in welcoming everybody here uh, tonight. It's, uh, as you know, for those of you who have been at our Chancellor's Lectures before, uh, we, this is now one of the really most important parts of our external uh, engagement with many people who have an interest uh, in Swinburne University. Our Chancellor's Lectures are really important for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, and not least of course, it does give us the opportunity to be able to engage with all of our friends and our alumni. And I think for every university it is very important that we maintain that relationship with you for a number of reasons, not the least, so that you can observe what's going on in your university, so you can make up your own minds about the way in which your university is developing, the way in which you can in fact see uh, um, your asset, in many ways your qualification, growing in value. And I make that point deliberately because when we see what we do, we do see it in, those, in that context. So when we talk about the fact that Swinburne is rated as one of the top 100 universities in the world for physics, we know what that does is add value to your qualification as an alumni here at Swinburne. When we see ourselves as one of the top 400 universities in the world, given that there are over 13,000 universities in the world, again, we see that as offering an increased value to your qualification here at Swinburne. So for that reason alone, these are really important occasions because it gives you a sense to be able to see the development and the, the increasing in value of hopefully what we've been able to provide to you in the past. Secondly, and very importantly of course, it is an important role for universities to be able to be a place where ideas are promulgated and debated. No matter what those ideas are, no matter how difficult those ideas are, no matter how controversial those ideas are, this is the place where people should feel safe in being able to debate those important issues that face our contemporary society. And as you would know, those of you who have been to previous Chancellor's Lectures, we've been blessed with the people that have, that have come before Ian to uh, provide us with uh, what I think have been some outstanding uh, lectures about a range of contemporary issues facing our society. So this is an important occasion and so I offer with Andrew and for all of the staff and the team here at Swinburne you know, our welcome to all of you for being here tonight. And it is my great pleasure to be able to introduce Justice e uh, Ian Ross tonight to you. Um, if you go to Ian's biography uh, on the uh, Fair Work Australia website, you will see a traditionally modest contribution, and, and I'll read it out to you. It says, Justin, uh, Justice Ian Ross, AO, is President of Fair Work Australia. Justice Ian Ross is a highly respected judicial, judicial officer with extensive experience dealing with workplace relations matters, including his time as Vice President of the Australian Industrial Relations Commission. So says Bill Shorten. It also goes on to say that uh, Justice Ross has been a Victorian Supreme Court judge, 
President of the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal, has also been Chair of the Council of Australian Tribunals, and he's held positions with the Australian Council of Trade Unions, worked with the Law Reform Commission in New South Wales and Victoria, and was also Vice President of the Australian Industrial Relations Commission, of course, so most of you would know that. I've actually known Ian since, uh, I think, the mid-1980s. I first came across Ian when he was uh, Assistant Secretary at the ACTU. And along with many of what I would regard as, uh, as some of our greatest leaders, uh, people like Bill Kelty, uh, people like Simon Crane, uh, and many like him, Ian was one of those individuals who was at the centre of the substantial reform in Australian society which opened up Australian society to the world. There are many like him, but many as good as Ian in, uh, and being part of that. So that was my first introduction to Ian. Over a period of time, I've, I've clearly watched Ian not only become an outstanding lawyer, but also become an outstanding judicial officer. Many people wouldn't understand the way in which he, in fact, has brought about substantial reform, for example, in VCAT. It's not sexy stuff to be able to say that somebody like Ian Ross has brought about the change at VCAT, VCAT which holds the individual officers within VCAT accountable for whether they meet particular targets. Difficult in, an, in a legal environment. But that's the sort of thing that you see Ian Ross doing. And similarly, for those that have been watching what's been going on within Fair Work Australia, he's bringing that same sense of discipline to Fair Work Australia. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Justice Ian Ross. Ian. Uh, thank you, Bill, and ladies and gentlemen, and for the opportunity to uh, discuss some of the issues facing the tribunal with you this evening. Bear with me for a sec while I try and get the technology sorted. Does that work? Okay. The focus of what I wanted to discuss this evening is the related concepts of accountability and public value. I particularly want to discuss the application of those ideas to the Fair Work Commission. Let me say something about the Commission first. Australia has had a national workplace relations tribunal for over a century. It's one of our key national institutions. Over time, the tribunal, currently known as the Fair Work Commission, has undergone many changes. Changes in its jurisdiction, its name, its functions and its structure. It's endured, I think, by successfully adapting to changes in its legislative environment and because it provides an independent, competent and professional dispute resolution service. But I firmly believe that past performance doesn't guarantee future survival. Even successful institutions have a tendency to decline unless they continue to innovate and adapt to changes in their environment. When I became president of the tribunal in March last year, it was apparent that the tribunal was facing a number of challenges. The number of challenges I hadn't quite appreciated when I became president, but I soon became aware of them. Um, it's interesting how you don't tend to focus on the media commentary about an organisation until you're part of it. And at that time, there was plenty of media commentary around VCAT, as there still is, and I was more focused on that than the debate around uh, what was then Fair Work Australia. Uh, over the previous 12 months or so, uh, the tribunal, then known as Fair Work Australia, had been subjected to sustained criticism. And these are some of the, my favourite headlines of the time. Um, and the criticism was about the time taken to complete the investigation into the Health Services Union. Now, this was an investigation that had everything. It had uh, a member of parliament in a minority government. It had uh, uh, allegations of credit card fraud, union money being used to pay for prostitutes, etc. And it is true 
that the investigations into the organisation were unprecedented in terms of their size and the complexity. But the inquiries and the subsequent investigations did take an unreasonably long time, raising legitimate questions. And justice institutions rely ultimately on public confidence and on the consent of the governed. There was an urgent need to repair the reputational damage to the tribunal, and the tribunal had to become more efficient and accountable. The Commission was also facing a significant shift in the nature of its work. The composition of our work had fundamentally changed from collective dispute resolution to individual dispute resolution. Um, what we see here is the fall, uh, you might not believe it if you were simply reading the papers, but the fall in industrial disputation over time. And disputation is now uh, generally associated with um, uh, the end of collective agreements. What this chart shows is the number of working days lost per thousand employees between 1988 and 2012. You can see that the average number of days has steadily declined throughout successive industrial relations regimes. Measured as working days lost, uh, the level of disputation that we've recently experienced is one-tenth of the level of disputation in the late 1980s. Now, collective dispute resolution will always be a core commission function. It'll be a core function because of the impact that such disputes have on the parties and the community generally. But we also have to recognise that individual dispute resolution is now a substantial part of our work and collective dispute resolution is declining in relative terms. You can see here, as you see that red line going up, uh, the red bars measure the number of individual disputes. Put in simple terms, uh, in the 1998 uh, financial year, collective disputes were about two-thirds of the applications that came into the tribunal, one-third individual disputes. In the most recent year for which we've got data, 2011 and 12, that's reversed. Now two-thirds of our work is individually based. It's either adverse action claims, it's, uh, it's about unfair dismissal claims or individual grievances under collective agreements. Now, a couple of things flow from that shift in the nature of our work. The first concerns the nature of the parties. The parties to collective disputes, unions, employers and employer organisations, are what the literature refers to as repeat players. They're familiar with the legislative environment and they're familiar with our procedures. And we take some knowledge for granted. The parties to individual disputes are quite different. And they're referred to in the literature as one-shotters. That is, they only have one engagement with the tribunal and often it's their only engagement with the justice system as a whole. They're unfamiliar with our processes and they're unfamiliar with the relevant legislative provisions. They're often self-represented. And like any justice institution, we have an obligation to explain those matters to self-represented parties to ensure they get a fair hearing. The shift in the nature of our work also has implications for our stakeholder base we needed to engage with the community more generally rather than simply with registered organisations. We sought to address those twin challenges by launching a change program in October last year uh, called Future Directions. Uh, it set out 25 initiatives that were aimed at improving the performance and quality of the services we provided. The initiatives are grouped around four broad themes, promoting fairness and improving access to justice, efficiency and innovation, increasing accountability and productivity and engaging with industry. We've issued two reports detailing our progress in implementing those 25 initiatives. 
in March and May this year. To date, we've implemented 20 of the 25 initiatives and the balance will be completed by the end of November this year. I want to turn to the measures we've introduced to increase accountability before discussing the idea or the concept of public value and what do I mean by it. So let's look first at accountability more generally. And this is something that applies not just to tribunals and justice institutions, uh, but to universities, uh, to the Reserve Bank, to all the institutions in our society. I think uh, we'd all generally agree that we live in an age that is accustomed to questioning all forms of authority. The community expects and demands more of its public institutions. The institutions of government are expected to operate with integrity and efficiency and are necessarily subject to accountability. Like other justice institutions, the Commission depends on community support for its legitimacy. And I think accountability and transparency are fundamental to that support. My starting proposition is that the Commission serves the community through the provision of an accessible, fair and efficient dispute resolution service. And in delivering that service, we are accountable to the community. I would contend that public support for a justice institution, whether it be a tribunal or a court, can be enhanced through increased accountability and transparency and by engaging with the community. Accountability and independence should be seen as complementary ideas rather than antithetical. Increasing public support for a tribunal increases its, resi its resilience. By resilience, I mean its capacity to withstand the occasional bump of negative publicity. And it also increases its independence and its effectiveness. Commission members are subject to a range of accountability measures, uh, much like tribunal members generally and judges. Hearings are generally held in public, Members are bound to provide parties with a fair hearing. The reasons for their decision must be given and published, and decisions are subject to appellate review. Tribunal members and justice officers generally accept that level of accountability as the price you pay for adjudicative independence, for being independent to determine the case before you according to law and on the basis of the argument that's put to you. Administrative independence requires a similar level of accountability and such independence will only be supported by the community as long as tribunals function with the same level of openness and transparency. So those were the broad conceptual ideas that then drove the change program and Future Directions contains a number of initiatives directed at increasing the accountability of the Commission. Uh, and each of uh, these initiatives have been fully implemented and I'll touch on a couple in more detail. There's now a member code of conduct uh, that's published on our website. We've introduced timeliness benchmarks, uh, information about the outcome of cases, both at conciliation and arbitration, is now in the public domain. We establish we, we publish reports on our progress in implementing our change program because our change program, when we launched it, became our compact with the community, our promise to introduce these initiatives. And the progress report delivers on that promise. We've also established a range of user groups to engage more fully with those that frequently appear before us. I want to touch on the Member Code of Conduct and the Timeliness Benchmarks. Uh, the Conduct uh, Guide, which as I mentioned is available on our website, has three main objectives. Uh, the first is to uphold public confidence in the Commission and in the, and in the administration of justice. Second, to enhance public respect for the Commission. And finally, to protect the reputation of individual members 
and of the Commission as a whole. Now, the primary responsibility for deciding whether or not a particular activity or course of conduct is appropriate uh, rests with the individual judicial officer. But any course of conduct that has the potential to put any one of those objectives at risk must be carefully considered and as far as possible avoided. Let me look at the timeliness benchmarks. And these were introduced after quite a deal of internal discussion. Um, and the benchmarks apply to the delivery of reserved decisions. That is, there's a hearing and the member says, well, look, I'm going to reserve my decision. I want to think about the arguments. I'll hand down written reasons in due course. And they also deal with the time taken to determine applications to approve agreements. Um, I'll return to that in a moment. In relation to reserve decisions, uh, the benchmark was 90% of all decisions were to be delivered within eight weeks and all decisions were to be delivered within 12 weeks. There were three benchmarks relating to the approval of agreements, bearing in mind we deal with about 7,000 agreement applications a year. The benchmarks provide that half of all applications have to be dealt with within three weeks, 90% within eight, and all applications within 12 weeks. Uh, when I started what drove both of these benchmarks, um, I, I had a number of um, uh, early inquiries about outstanding reserve decisions. Um, one that particularly sticks in my mind about agreement approvals uh, was I had an employer organisation ringing in quite a, a polite, measured way, uh, saying, uh, asking whether there was any chance their agreement approval application would be determined before the agreement actually expired. And given it was a two-year agreement, I thought that was a reasonable question. Um, now, the improvement of those benchmarks, and we publish, we make public both the benchmark and our performance against the benchmark, uh, has seen a significant improvement in the tribunal's performance. Um, in the 12 months to June, 30 June this year, 87.6% uh, of all reserve decisions were handed down within eight weeks, as opposed to the benchmark of 90%. If you look at the 12 months before the benchmark was introduced, uh, only just over 70% of agreements of reserve decisions were handed down within eight weeks. And 14%, about one in seven, of reserve decisions took more than 12 weeks to hand down. Now, over 95% of all reserve decisions are handed down within 12 weeks. There's been a similar improvement in the time taken to approve agreements. Uh, again, in the 12 months to 30 June this year, 65% uh, of all applications were dealt with within three weeks against a benchmark of 50%. In the previous 12 months, only 58% of agreement approval applications were dealt with in that time frame. As I've indicated, our performance against those benchmarks is uh, published on our website and updated monthly. Um, I'm not putting them up to say I'm satisfied with the performance. Uh, I think uh, there's scope to improve in both of the benchmark areas. And I'm currently taking a number of steps to further improve our performance in those key areas. The timeliness benchmarks are intended to be challenging. There's not much point in setting a benchmark that you can easily reach and doesn't stretch an organisation. And to that extent, they are aspirational. And I expect there will be individual circumstances where we don't meet those high standards. But the setting of performance benchmarks and publicly reporting the tribunal's performance against them are important accountability measures. Those measures are a practical recognition of the fact that we rely ultimately on public confidence. And I want to take this opportunity to announce some additional accountability measures uh, that will be on our website tomorrow. Uh, we'll launch a new section of our website dealing with appeals and judicial reviews of commission decisions. And we'll report against two new uh, accountability measures. 90% of all appeals will be listed for hearing within 10 weeks of lodgement. 
and 100% of all appeals will be listed for hearing within 12 weeks of lodgement. We will also report against the reserve decision benchmark applying to appeal decisions, and it will be the same that applies to all of our decisions, 90% within eight weeks and 100% within 12 weeks. Uh, we will provide a link to all of our appeal decisions and a table setting out the outcome of our appeals and our judicial reviews over time. I want to now touch on the, the broader issue of public value. In the private sector, the aim of management is, broadly speaking, uh, to make money for the shareholders. In simple terms, it's about producing products or services that can be sold to generate revenue and make profits. Success can be measured in terms of profitability, market share and share price. I say in simple terms because that might be the theory of the firm, but I know in the private sector it's slightly more complicated, but bear with me for a moment. What is clear is that it's much more difficult to define and measure success in the public sector. Uh, Harvard professor Mark Moore defines the aim of managers in the public sector in terms of creating public value. The evaluation of programs and cost effectiveness analysis can help define public value in terms of collectively defined objectives. And that's the framework we're starting to apply to the Commission's activities. We can enhance our public value by providing an efficient dispute resolution service, a service that resolves disputes in a timely and appropriate way and minimises the costs incurred by the parties. And we're taking a number of steps to improve that service delivery and reduce costs for parties in engaging with the organisation. The information and assistance provided by the Commission to parties, particularly self-represented parties, is an important part of providing affordable access to justice. We now provide a range of online information tools to assist parties who appear before us, including eligibility checklists, an online uh, checklist to assist potential applicants to work out if they fall within our unfair dismissal jurisdiction. Outcome information. We publish the outcomes of unfair dismissal conciliations in aggregate and arbitrations on our website. We have a range, an extensive range of online guides. And more recently, uh, we've put bench books on our website. A bench book is a resource that brings together all of the leading decisions that have been made on key aspects of a particular jurisdiction. They're resources that are widely used by judges and tribunal members in a range of courts and tribunals. Uh, but they're not often published. Uh, for many years, Commission members have had, have had access to an unfair dismissal bench book. Early this year, that bench book was extensively reviewed and written in plain, in plain English. In July this year, we made the revised bench book publicly available. And it contains plain English summaries of the key principles that emerged from unfair dismissal cases since the legislation came in. The bench book will assist both applicants and respondents to prepare their case before the Commission. Access to justice can also be enhanced by facilitating access to pro bono legal services. The provision of timely legal advice can promote efficiency by focusing the proceedings on the real issues in dispute. In some instances, it may also lead a party to discontinue an application because there is another more appropriate forum in which to address their grievance. For the past 12 months, we've supported a pilot program in Western Australia to assist self-represented applicants who have lodged a claim alleging that their employer has taken adverse action against them. Those applicants were referred to the Employment Law Centre of Western Australia to obtain some short, focused legal advice. The results of the pilot have been encouraging. 
This form of triaging is important because it ensures that parties pursue their claim in the appropriate jurisdiction and it discourages unmeritorious claims. It benefits applicants, respondents and the tribunal. Uh, a copy of um, the evaluation report is available on our website. The method we've used there to pilot, to evaluate externally and then to implement what works is one that we're applying across all of our change initiatives. We're currently looking at how we can extend the program to other states and have recently launched a pro bono pilot in Melbourne where the parties to jurisdictional objections in unfair dismissal matters, both applicants and respondent employers who are self-represented can have access to pro bono legal services on the day of their hearing to assist them in running their case. We've also made greater use of technology to improve our work processes, our service delivery and our accountability. We intend to move to smart online application forms where the information entered can be automatically uploaded into our case management system. I want to touch on two technology driven innovations which are worth mentioning. In May this year, we started trialling SMS alerts uh, to parties in unfair dismissal proceedings. The alerts are sent to parties 24 hours before their scheduled proceeding. The objective is to reduce the number of adjournments which occur because a party has simply forgotten that it's their schedule to participate in a conference or a hearing. And bearing in mind we're dealing with a large proportion of self-represented parties and they've got a range of other things on their mind. The hearing notice goes out often uh, uh, many weeks ahead of the hearing or the conference and they simply forget. If we can reduce the number of adjournments that occur as a result of a party not turning up, then we can reduce the transaction costs and the inconvenience for parties and deliver a more efficient service. In July this year, uh, we introduced the smartphone app, which provides users with, a quick, with quick and easy access to our daily hearing lists. The app can be downloaded from our website. You can use it to view and search hearing lists up to seven days in advance of a hearing. You can also get directions from where you are to where the hearing's being held. Again, it's designed to assist parties who are unfamiliar with where we are, who haven't had any previous engagement with us. I want to conclude by uh, making some brush strokes on a broader canvas, by discussing how the Commission might contribute to improving our productivity performance as a nation. Productivity matters. Our productivity performance underpins our standard of living. National growth rates are determined by three factors. Population, participation and productivity. The 2010 intergenerational report produced by the Treasury, the last one they've done, projected that over the next 40 years we'll see real growth in our economy slow to 2.7 per cent per annum, down from an average of 3.3 per cent over the past 40 years. Slower economic growth means lower income growth for all of us. And real GDP per capita is projected to slow to 1.5 per cent. Now the major thing that's driving uh, this projection about slower growth and slower incomes is the ageing population. Consider two simple facts. By 2050, which is getting closer by the day, nearly one quarter of us will be aged 65 and over, compared to about 13% at the moment. And there will only be 2.7 people of working age, by that I mean I adopt the statistical definition of uh, 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 between uh, 16 and 65 for every person aged 65 and over. Now that ratio at the moment is 5 to 1. So in other words, um, there are going to be more people 
the traditional conception would be of retirement age, uh, a lot more than there are at the moment, and fewer people of working in the working population uh, to provide any sort of support. As the population ages, the workforce participation rate falls. What all this means is that over the coming decades, when we spoke, when I spoke before about population participation and productivity driving growth, it's clear that productivity in the coming decades will have to do the heavy lifting if as a country we are to continue to enjoy rising living standards. The point's probably made clear by this chart. And if we look at the last bar on the right hand side, uh, you see this is what uh, drives growth. What's driven growth in average income over these periods? You look at the most recent period in the 2000s, What's driven growth? The, one of the major contributions has been the terms of trade, the mining boom. And you can see the grey bit, that's the contribution of labour productivity. Well, uh, I think almost every economist might be the only thing they agree on, is that the terms of trade have peaked. And so that blue bit isn't going to be making the same contribution in the coming decades. So something else is going to have to go up if we're going to have rising living standards. And <clears throat> the challenge is that our productivity performance, however measured, has declined substantially since the late 1990s. Now while the precise causes are the subject of ongoing debate, I think the real issue is what's to be done about it. And public policy settings and institutional support can facilitate productivity growth because they affect the environment in which business operates. But the key to improving productivity lies at the workplace level. And the Commission is committed to the development of a new workplace engagement strategy in consultation with the major peak employer and union bodies. The object of this initiative is to promote cooperative and productive workplace relations. <coughs> to shift the focus to the prevention of disputes rather than their settlement. <coughs> I knew my throat would go at some point. The object of this initiative um, is to promote cooperative and productive workplace relations. The development of a more cooperative workplace culture that facilitates change and fosters innovation will be at the heart of our engagement strategy. Many factors impact on productivity and competitiveness. The skills of our workforce, infrastructure, taxation, the general regulatory environment, participation and the capacity for enterprises to successfully innovate. By facilitating more cooperative relationships, we can assist <clears throat> the industrial parties to find common ground in at least some of these areas. And we've already taken a number of steps in this regard. ACCI, AI Group and the ACTU have committed to working collaboratively with the Commission in a consultative way that will oversee the Tribunal's engagement strategy. In August this year, I set up a workplace engagement team led by Vice President Catanzariti to further develop our strategy for promoting cooperative and productive workplaces. The project team will report back to me in October this year. The development of our engagement strategy will be transparent and will be done in consultation with the key industry peak bodies, the members of the Commission and the community we serve. Our engagement strategy won't be a panacea for the productivity challenge that faces us as a nation, but each public institution must play its part. The implementation of the, tw thank you very much, of the 25 initiatives set out in our Future Directions Change Program will be a major achievement for the organisation. 
It's a testament to the hard work and commitment of our staff, members and our stakeholders. But the implementation of these initiatives marks a beginning rather than an end. We are intent on improving our performance across the range of our statutory functions. As we complete this phase of our change program, we will begin a consultation process that will develop the set of initiatives we will implement over the next two years. These initiatives will be directed at enhancing the public value of our organisation. I look forward to your contribution to that process and to your support in making a great institution better. Thank you very much. Do you want to do questions? Yes, sure, sure. of course. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we do have an opportunity to take some questions from the audience. Could you please, uh, we have some microphones, so please wait until we're able to get a microphone to you. Uh, and if you could uh, state your name, uh, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ian. That's a fantastic insight into workplace productivity and development in Australia. Uh, I, had a, I had a thought, and the thought was that clearly there is a need to improve productivity, right? Uh, I wonder what is the relationship between the, the increase in productivity and upskilling of the workforce? Oh, I think um, there's, a, there's a substantial uh, relationship between the increase in improvement in skills and the utilisation of those skills in practice uh, and productivity. Uh, I think if you look at the drivers, it is around education and upskilling and around the introduction of technological change and changing work processes. And I think that's why we've seen um, a shift around the world and more of a focus on both early childhood education, primary, secondary and tertiary education because ultimately that's what's going to drive performance. Um, we're, we're not in, a, in the space where we can compete uh, on making widgets. Uh, we don't have uh, the volume, we don't have the economies of scale to compete in that area. So if you take manufacturing as an example, we have to compete in smart manufacturing. We have to compete at the high end and to do that you have to have the appropriate skill mix. One of the challenges in manufacturing uh, is, and I was surprised, I was at a, a forum that CETA ran um, on the future of manufacturing and one of the speakers indicated that in manufacturing in Australia uh, about 30% of the manufacturing workforce are functionally illiterate or innumerate. Now the challenge for us is how do we uh, deal with that issue? How do we confront that reality so they can adapt and change into a rapidly changing uh, environment in not only that sector but across sectors generally? Um, my name is Peter Harkness. I'm an academic member of the business faculty here uh, and also secretary of the Swinburne branch of the National Tertiary Education Union. Um, thank you very much, Justice Ross, for your uh, interesting talk and uh, for uh, um, you know, informing us on the uh, considerable progress you've made to um, making the uh, Fair Work Commission more transparent, um, more accountable in those several ways that you have described tonight. Consequently, I'd be interested in uh, your reaction to the fact that here at Swinburne we're moving in the opposite direction. I've been here for 26 years and I remember very clearly when uh, the University Council or Institute Council, uh, its um, monthly meetings 
uh, were public. Um, uh, there was a public gallery. Um, its agenda and minutes were public. There were representatives of academic staff uh, and non-academic staff. And I'm just wondering what your reaction is to me telling you, which is the case, that in just the last um, few years, all of these things have gone. Um, under our current Chancellor and Vice-Chancellor, the meetings are now uh, in camera. There's no public gallery. No one can go to the meetings. We don't know what the agenda is. We don't know what the decisions are. The minutes are confidential. Um, do you agree that this is um, a case of one public institution, namely this university, heading in a very different direction to what you have described uh, as the direction that the Fair Work Commission is heading in tonight? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I've been a judicial officer now for nearly um, 25 years and the one thing I've um, learnt over that period is not to make a decision when you've only heard one half of the argument. Um, and I, I don't think I'm in any position uh, to comment on uh, the governance arrangements or uh, how matters are approached uh, at Swinburne. Um, uh, I, can, I can only comment with any authority on our own uh, governance arrangements and our own accountability measures. And I think from our perspective, uh, I think we've got uh, uh, some way to go. Uh, as I mentioned before, I think it's in, the change measures we've introduced are important, uh, but they're a beginning, not an end. And we are in a stage of transitioning into a more efficient uh, and uh, transparent organisation. But I wouldn't want to leave you with the impression that, that I have the view that we're at the end point at the moment. Yeah, Justice Ross. Glenn Gould, I'm a retired communications engineer. I'm a free wheeling person, so I'm not involved in political correctness. But what I see, where the danger is, we had a minister who's suddenly decided to uh, get rid of the NBN uh, board. And I was wondering whether the Rabbit government will get rid of the Fair Work Australian Commission. I'm very concerned about the direction this government is taking. And I believe that the work of the Fair Work Commission, the people in there are very dedicated. They're giving their heart and soul to the work. And you have a Philistine government that's liable to get rid of it. Would you like to make any comments? Thank you. I take it. You don't want me to comment on whether it's a Philistine government or not, I'm taking it. But um, look, um, for what it's worth, I think um, uh, what we've seen to date is that um, a government that will be intent on implementing uh, the agenda it took to the election. Um, and I suspect um, uh, not going much further than that. And I think that's been made very clear in the workplace relations space. Uh, I don't think um, uh, that issue, I've got no indication that uh, abolition is on the agenda. They certainly have announced uh, uh, legislative changes around um, uh, the regulation of the building industry, right of entry, etc. Um, and I've, the position I take on those things is the same as the position I took with the previous government. Uh, I don't think it's appropriate uh, for me or indeed any member of the Commission to get involved in that debate around what's the appropriate balance between the rights of employees and unions and the rights of employers. I think those are intensely political issues. Um, I will and have. Uh, I have previously got involved in debates uh, that go to the independence uh, of the institution uh, and I'll certainly defend those conceptual issues. Uh, but uh, I've not um, I don't have any sense that um, uh, there's any abolition agenda. I think, if anything, what we've seen uh, over the past decade is a narrowing of the issues between the two major parties around workplace relations issues. If you look at the Fair Work Act, uh, compare it with previous uh, legislative um, uh, frameworks, 
uh, I think we're seeing a narrowing uh, rather than a broadening. Uh, and the area of uh, disagreement between the major political parties is more confined now than perhaps it was historically. We've got time for one more question. Yeah, very quick one. What mechanisms, if any, do you have formally or in your collective culture for the resolution of uh, differences of opinion and conflict between members? Oh, uh, yes. Well, it's a bit like that Monty Python um, line that we're all individuals. And um, uh, look, you do have uh, differences of view. Um, I've uh, sat, when I was previously there and now, on, I guess, um, uh, 12 national wage, annual wage reviews. And there's always a vigorous debate. Uh, and um, there was only one, uh, there've only been two occasions historically when there's been a split decision. Um, Dick Kirby was, was uh, in one and I was in the other one. Um, but um, overwhelmingly, we try and resolve uh, differences of view to end up with a single determination. You occasionally will have differences of view because particularly in the early life cycle of a legislative framework, because interpreting legislation is more art than science. Trying to discern what the legislative intent was is no easy exercise and reasonable minds can come to a different view about it. I think you find that we have uh, overwhelmingly unanimous decisions uh, in relation to our appeals and our full bench decisions, especially when you compare it with the performance of courts at appellate level, uh, where it's uh, more common uh, to have uh, individual judgments, even where all of the judges agree. Um, so we endeavour to do it, but uh, each member takes an oath of office to faithfully discharge their duties and uh, they're entitled uh, to exercise uh, their independence uh, and their view, uh, and they do. And look, the uh, development of the change process and the timeliness benchmarks uh, and the code of conduct uh, were the subject of, um, of vigorous internal discussion and debate and a consultation process. Um, so I don't think um, uh, it's not a case of, um, of one collective view. Like most institutions, uh, everyone has their own opinion and we try and work around uh, and move together as an organisation. So you would accept the two of us all? Well, I think, look, I'm not suggesting it's not without its challenges. Tribunal members, like judges, um, have a strong sense of their independence and I think that's appropriate. I think what has unified us around some of these issues is a common understanding that we need to engage more with the community, we need to explain more what we do, and we need to be more transparent and accountable. Because they all want to see the institution survive and prosper. And to do that, you have to change. Okay. Not sure how I get this off. Uh, now, to, uh, to offer a vote of thanks and to draw the door prize for the evening, I'd like to welcome our Chancellor back to the stage. Thank you. I, I suspect you might all be here for the door prize. That's the... <laughs> it's a, no, I'm, I'm, I'm actually joking about that. Uh, uh, Ian, thank you very much for, I think, what was uh, both an inspiring and an illuminating address. Uh, I think what we've observed tonight is something that is, in fact, quite rare in a judicial context, and that is uh, the head of a judicial uh, broad community uh, making it very clear that those within that judicial environment uh, have to be accountable in the same way that all of us are for our actions, and that's a rare thing. And I don't think we should discount what that actually means and the, the effort that, that, uh, that Ian uh, has had to bring to be able to uh, bring those sorts of reforms into the Fair Work Commission. 
I think the other thing that we have heard tonight is something that we all should be encouraged by, and that is the way in which the Commission itself is arguing that not only should it be efficient, but it, uh, in addition to that, is actually arguing that it, it has an important role in Australia's ongoing uh, productivity debate and effort. And I think in, in that sense, we're seeing something, again, quite revolutionary. And so, again, I don't think we should discount that. So, Ian, can I thank you very much for being so open with us for being um, so prepared, I think, to strengthen this institution. We can argue, as you quite rightly said, the extent to which there should be various sorts of labour law, but what we will not argue, I don't suspect, is there ought to be labour law. And the way by which that is applied, I think, is, quite frankly, in excellent hands. So, you know, on behalf of everybody here tonight, can I thank you for giving us an outstanding address and in that regard, can I give you a small presentation on behalf of us all? Michael Grubert. Are you here, Michael? <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> and on that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Amy. A wonderful impromptu performance. Uh, <laughs> we thank you all for your attendance this evening. We will very shortly be publishing our uh, dates and topics and uh, presenters for the 2014 Chancellor's Lecture Series. Uh, but again, thank you for your support. Thank you for your attendance. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at our, our next Chancellor's Lecture uh, during next year. Thank you again. Thank you.